Good morning. Do not arise from you. 
and are an affront to the expanse of your love and grace. Grant us the strength to look beyond so many inequalities around us to see that you continue to love with abandon. Grant us the courage to live according to the unrestrained nature of your love. May we embrace the fuller expression of your grace for everyone. Our opening hymn is Let Us Break Bread Together in the Blue Hymnal, uh, number 618. <laughs>
morning. What joys or concerns do you have to share this time? Praise God, God. Praise the Lord that my family is able to make it home from Asheville. All the way to my brother and his baby family. We need to continue to pray for everybody who's been affected by this horrible, catastrophic weather situation. We rejoice with Andy and Gerilyn that uh, family uh, was able to come from Asheville uh, safely this week, that Andy's knee is healing, and uh, we pray for everyone affected by Helene and this uh, great disaster. Uh, others? Gina? Rejoice with Gina in being able to communicate with family affected by Helene, and they are all safe. Um, and uh, with um, good results from the breast cancer retreat and how that had, was able to impact positively many people. Others? John? Sure, joy to share. Duncan, and what was that last? Born on October, October 1st. October 1st. Okay. Kim, October 1st, and we pray for her as she was born premature and all the complications that that brings uh, to her and the family. So we rejoice in that. Um, Diana? Ruby Britt's in the hospital in Monroe, uh, running tests to figure out what's going on. Susan? Uh, a couple of things. One of them, I uh, ask forgiveness for my lack of faith in this, but I want to pray for peace in the Middle East. It seems like an impossible thing, but things are just escalating so much there, and uh, no way to figure out it's going to take the Lord's hand to do anything. That's what Paul is saying. And you praying for peace in the Middle East. Too many actors uh, don't want peace. And we pray for God's intervention there. Uh, we rejoice with so many who have been offering help in the mountains. And I was also able to meet several people this week who were involved in different ways of, of offering help and assistance, and we celebrate that. Others?
We pray for Gerilyn, who is ill and worn out, and what all from, from this week. And we thank Liddell for her uh, presence with us, uh, filling in today. Others? Tammy will be meeting with the surgeon on tonight to talk about possibly having surgery on her neck. And um, we're going to pray for Ruth that she's recovering. And also thank the Lord for Seth family, both the Scott family up there in Nashville. And I have been contacted, it took me just four days to get a hold of her, but they have power, but they would don't have water and possibly won't have it for several weeks. Give thanks for Bucky's family being safe as well, uh, having power but not, not water. Um, and Tammy, with a meeting with a surgeon coming up on the 9th, and pray for her as she looks at possibilities there. Um, I had contact from a friend this week in Asheville who said that the uh, water treatment plant was just destroyed and it'll be months before they can really address that road to where they would do maintenance was also washed out. So just further complicating matters for them. Others? Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, our hearts are broken for so many who are struggling in many different and unexpected ways. We don't understand great storms like Helene and all the destruction and devastation that heavy rains can bring about. So many have been affected and we pray for those involved in search and rescue, in recovery efforts, those who are just struggling to find some kind of secure footing for life moving forward, for rebuilding, finding safety and support. We pray for Amy, for Andy, Carol, Craven, Leslie, Irvin, Jennifer, Lydell, Matt, Jonathan, Zach, Doris, Gerilyn, Natalie, Patricia, Ruth, Sheila, Tammy, Debbie, Lewis, Tracy, Denise, Tommy, Barbara, Don, Larry, Bucky's family, Julie, Brian, Martha, Jacob, Alyssa, Margaret, Ruby. We pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for those involved in recovery efforts after Helene. We pray for family, giving thanks for communication with those who are far from us to relieve our concerns. <clears throat> we thank you for all those who were able to participate at this breast cancer retreat, receiving help, resources, and support from the community. Lord, so many are affected and so many are reaching out to offer assistance and grace and love. Help us to focus our own efforts in offering tangible expressions of your love, your grace, your welcome, inclusion, and goodness. That the world around us might see you living and active within our lives and beyond them. We give you thanks for your care, for loving us, and not us alone, but all the world of your creation. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
dependence upon you in all things. For life, for breath, for food, for water, for community, for strength, for all that would support our lives and that would support those around us as well. Grant us to participate with you in providing for the needs of all that you have lost, not only ourselves, but all those around us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would join me with the great thanksgiving included in your bulletin. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, your breath moved over the face of the waters. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your breath came upon the prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your breath anointed Jesus to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would redeem your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and your breath. When the Lord ascended, Christ promised to be with us always in the power of your word and your holy breath. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is my lifeblood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembering, in remembrance of these things, these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ suffering for us as we proclaim this mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your holy breath on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your breath make us one with Christ, one with one another, 
and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the lifeblood of Christ. The body and blood of Christ, which is for you. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your breath to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to come forward to receive the elements.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ and his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. It is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I invite you to turn your attention with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, we'll be reading verses 2 through 16. Listen for the word of the living God as we read these words. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to turn out his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and turn her out. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever turns out his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she turns out her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not block them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the reign of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The living God still speaks today. Thanks be to God. All too often, our social norms have more to do with protecting the balance of power in our relationships and social hierarchies than we recognize. What things matter to us may lay firmly built in our cultural DNA to the point we don't even recognize them or notice what it is we are actually protecting and hanging on to. When it comes to measuring our lives against God's will, purposes, and values, we seem to focus on anything other than what meets God's purposes for us. What are we protecting when we hang on tightly to our tradition? And norms. I came across someone this week lamenting the struggle they're having with planning a wedding for herself and her partner. They've been together for a decade. But they're now making their relationship official in the eyes of tradition and the law. I don't know much of this this couple's particular situation. 
but I've seen similar stories. Now they are attempting to reconcile how they understand their relationship with received traditions regarding the important elements of a wedding. People are often confused when they asked me to perform a traditional wedding. I have to ask them which tradition they are talking about. I've been present at traditional weddings in Brazil, in Mexico, in several states around the US among different cultures. No two of them have been alike. When Karen and I wrote the ceremony for our wedding, we started with a minister's manual that listed four different traditions for the liturgy. There was an Episcopal one, there was a Presbyterian one, there was a Catholic one, there was something else. There were other options for dealing with antiquated terms or attempting to give new significance to holdovers from a different era. Is the bride being given away? That would indicate she's property to be given or sold, wouldn't it? Does the wedding dress have to be white? That's supposed to indicate her virginity, though there is nothing similar in regard to the groom's expected attire. Need the bride wear a veil? That goes back to arranged marriage in which the groom had never yet seen the bride. Is there to be a party of attendance? Well, that goes back to the idea of confusing the evil spirits so they would be unable to curse the correct couple, the real bride and groom on their wedding. Do we throw rice, bird seed, or blow bubbles at the couple after the ceremony? That calls back to fertility rites, seeking the promise of many children to the couple. Do we separate those attending between bride and groom sides of the church? That calls back to a time of arranged marriages, doesn't it? Do we ask any cause whereby the couple should not be joined together? That goes back to a time in which marriage licenses were not issued by the authorities ensuring that they were not already married to someone. Perhaps we get around to asking some of those questions and addressing shifting understandings of marriage. What we rarely do, however, is stop to ask what lies at the heart of a marriage that needs to be addressed at the ceremony. The Pharisees in today's passage have come to Jesus attempting to catch him by trapping him in a corner. A corner between law, tradition, and his message of grace. Popular practices around divorce went so far as for some to claim a man had the right to kick his wife out of the house if she displeased him in any way, including having burnt the day's bread. It was an extreme position, yet it was based on interpretations of a couple of verses in which Divorce was allowable, and a man finding, quote, something displeasing in his new bride as sufficient cause for returning her as damaged goods. Jesus did not take the bait. He addressed the purpose of marriage setting a foundation on which we understand marriage as the union of equal partners, jointly becoming one. 
He allows for divorce in his response, but he addresses the problem behind the wording of their question. The question was not actually about divorce, regardless of what our traditional read of the passage says. They asked about putting out one's spouse, kicking her to the street from which she would have no recourse for self-care without some other man stepping up to bring her under his care. Jesus cast such actions as the actor simply not accepting his responsibilities. Kicking her out does not absolve him of his marriage responsibilities, nor does it free him to remarry. First, he must grant her the liberty that she might remarry, giving her the means to make a new life. Victim blaming has been around for a long time, hasn't it? We like to prop up our power differentials to keep our norms and structures away from scrutiny. The threat and practice of putting out one's wife was not only a power play to control her, it was also a strategy protecting the husband from any accusation while actively discrediting the wife, making her responsible for anything and everything. Jesus reminds his listeners that it was due to their hard-headed ways that Moses had demanded they give her a certificate of divorce in the event they turned her out. They had to treat the case openly and publicly absolve her of any more responsibility to her husband, freeing her to remarry. He then told them that not living up to what Moses commanded, they took upon themselves all the blame and responsibility for her eventual infidelity. The question here was not whether divorce was legitimate. It was brought to legitimate the power that men held over women under their control. Actually, that was never questioned. It was so deeply rooted behind the question, even they could not see it as needing to be addressed. It just was. That's what Jesus does in his answer, however. He says that God's purpose in marriage was to join two lives inseparably into one. This was the ideal. Though Moses allowed divorce as an escape valve when a relationship to, should turn toxic, for we do not live up to God's ideal. Next, people tried to bring children up to be blessed by Jesus, and his disciples blocked it. They were blocking the children from Jesus pretty much the same language here as we saw in last Sunday's passage. When Jesus addressed their gatekeeping as putting stumbling blocks before others. Here they were being stumbling blocks toward these children. Just as the disparity of power between men and women, so there was equal disparity of power between adults and children. Paul goes so far in writing in Romans to claim that a child had less rights than a slave until they reached the age of maturity. The power dynamics from their 
social traditions were showing through their actions in ways they could not even recognize. Oh, the disciples were simply protecting Jesus. Jesus' time, Jesus' attention, Jesus' strength didn't need to be wasted on such as these. From their perspective, Jesus' time and attention should be saved for those who actually mattered. They were not simply jealous of Jesus' attention, however. They were still clinging to the greater power and importance that society granted them for simply being men and adults. They were clinging to their privileged status as though it had any real substance. While the disciples portrayed their actions as protecting Jesus, what they were really about went completely counter to Jesus' interests and the principles of God's reign. Rather than protecting Jesus, they were unwittingly protecting the social inequalities in which they were enmeshed. They did not see how their own actions and attitudes were rising from holding different categories of people as having varied worth before God. Those attitudes did not come from Jesus. They did not reflect God's reign. We struggle with the same issues today. We readily cling to what our families and our societies have taught us about who has value, who is important, and whom we can simply ignore, count as irrelevant. There are those we are quick to protect. There are victims we are quick to blame. And those whose access we obstruct in our attempts to be Jesus' protection detail. That doesn't protect Jesus. The only thing it really protects are our perceptions regarding inequality. I invite you to join me for our closing hymn in your blue hymn. 617.
grant that we might truly speak your praise. Reflecting who you truly are. How you have come to open our eyes to see the breadth of humanity around us. To see beyond humanity and see all of creation as loved by you. As life for which you care. As life for whom you died. May we look with open eyes, not attempting to continue to be gatekeepers of your reign but heralds and ambassadors to invite all in that together we might proclaim your goodness, your grace, your welcome, your acceptance. For it's in Christ's name we pray.